PC Perry here, still with Flying Focus Video Collective. Welcome to the 32nd bus anniversary, where our group shares coverage with you from what happened last year. I helped with co-founding Flying Focus in 1991 during the so-called Gulf War, also known as the massacre in the Middle East. As field coordinator, I was out and about this year recording video on 10 of our programs. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Handelman. I've also been part of Flying Focus since the beginning. We started out as part of a coalition opposing the first war in Iraq, but went independent soon after that. Then, 31 years later, in July 2022, we became a project group of Peace and Justice Works. Topics of this year's shows include several featuring Indigenous people sharing wisdom, organizing to help those in need, saving the environment, labor, police accountability, and peace issues. On this bus anniversary, we will share clips from 24 episodes we produced between November 2022 and October 2023. I recorded video for one and two others came from Zoom recordings. This bus anniversary gives us a chance to review our work and come out from behind the cameras to show we're just ordinary people making TV. You can watch videos on our website at www.flyingfocus.org and on YouTube. Come join us to volunteer with Flying Focus, support us, or give us your feedback on our shows. Call 503-239-7456. You can also call or text 503-321-5051 or email us ffbc at flyingfocus.org. Unlike so many mainstream TV shows, we think creatively and act civically. You will not find commercials or pay-to-play perspectives. Instead, we feature voices of those who can name the problems and propose ways to fix them. Watch with us as we share clips from this year's shows. Hi again. In this last year, I produced seven programs and I edited part of all 13 shows. Last year, we told you that one of our longtime producer volunteers, Yvonne Simmons, died in July of 2022, and we showed a few clips from among the 25-plus Flying Focus shows she worked on. In September 2022, there was a virtual memorial held over Zoom, where we remembered Yvonne with stories, we watched longer versions of those clips, and we listened to songs sung by Yvonne and featured photos from her very adventurous life. In these clips, you'll hear from just a few of the people at the memorial, including Desiree Helligers, who co-hosted the event with me. Another speaker is Regina Burcham, a former president of the U.S. branch of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, who knew Yvonne and appeared on at least a few of our Flying Focus shows. Thanks to Open Signal, Portland Community Media's production team, which took care of all the video switching and recording for the 90-minute live event. I edited down to two half-hour episodes of the video bus with a deliberately dual-meaning title, A Life of Loving Activism. Here are the clips. Listen to the women, hear our voices, study our Welcome to this um, memorial service for Yvonne Simmons. It's a daunting task ahead of us today to try to do some measure of justice to Yvonne's wild, courageous, unbelievably creative, loving, community-centered life. Her commitment to ending war and violence against women led Yvonne to bring aid to women and children under siege in Sarajevo in the 1990s. Many of the women that she worked with had been systematically raped. Yvonne was honored for that work when she was named Woman of the Year by the Oregonian. I've got the nobody loves me, nobody feeds me, all the flowing cat box blues. I knew Yvonne since we were 16 and 17, and I was with her, we were the post-war children of the 70s, 60s and 70s, looking for adventure. Everything was Beatles, Maniac, Carnaby Street, there's lots going on, and it was a lovely time to be alive. We travelled all over Europe, France, Spain, and I spent many, many happy times with her in Italy and had so many adventures. You've all brought all those things back to mind of what a precious per person she was. I had met her first at uh, Women's International League Congresses or meetings in the U.S. and then internationally. And I would say what was so outstanding about her was that she didn't take a lot of space for herself for self-aggrandizement. 
or that sort of thing. She was always there to do what needed to be done in her own creative way. We're coming round again. We're coming round again. The next show features activist Judy Gumbo, who was part of the Youth International Party in the 1960s known as the Yippies. She got her nickname Gumbo from Eldridge Cleaver of the Black Panther Party. Gumbo appeared at Portland State University to talk about a memoir she wrote titled Yippie Girl. She read excerpts from the book and answered questions from the audience. You'll hear her in these clips talking a little bit about why she felt it was important to write the book, working with the Panthers, and her philosophy about organizing. Some footage in the show came from Dan Shea of Veterans for Peace Portland chapter, but most of it was recorded by PC. Her overall message was that we must keep organizing to ensure a better world, so I titled the show, Judy Gumbo, Never Give Up. Uh, I wanted to make sure that women's voices were, were part of the history of the 60s. And at the time I wrote it, and it took me 10 years, but at the time I wrote it, it was basically the, the, uh, the uh, books were written by guys, and it was a kind of a guy's history. And so what I was able to do was add that woman's voice. I learned from all the Panthers that how important it is to stand up for what you believe and fight for what you believe. That, I would say, is the, is the major lesson that I learned from them. And that, but you have to do it in a way that is moral and ethical. And I know that there was a lot of stuff around the Panthers. Well, they weren't this and they weren't that, and that's true. They weren't the world's most uh, uh, amenable people to some stuff, but they were fundamental leaders and really brought the black revolutionary movement along in an enormous way. I wrote historical recitation of facts for about seven or eight years, and then I said, I don't like this, it's not what I want. And so I, Basically, I took some classes in writing, and I started to think through, and, it, and then I was able to write a book where a lot of personal and emotional stories that were in my heart, I was actually able to put them on paper. L let me just say that this is something that I just wrote as something to impart here, which is, um, uh, we face a well-funded, well-organized, racist, misogynist, and powerful right-wing backlash at the moment. A minority of friends tell me that we failed. We did not. We were anti-war, anti-racist, anti-misogyny, pro-women's rights, LGBTQ, and trans freedom, and saving our environment. And we still are. All our social protest movements are far more influential today than when I first encountered them back in the day. We have not fully succeeded, but we have also not failed. If I've learned one thing over my decades as a protester, it is this pessimism is not a winning strategy. An associate professor from Oregon State University named David Lewis gave a talk back in April about the history of indigenous people in the Willamette Valley. The talk mostly focused on the tribes in the Portland area as they struggled with devastating pandemics and the influx of Europeans who sought to capitalize on fur and other items found in abundance in the region. I produced a show of the event, and in these clips you'll hear him talk about how the tribes interacted in the early 1800s and how the arrival of European settlers changed things. There are also drawings illustrating what indigenous life was like at the time. His talk connected the past tribal migrations and colonial injustices to ongoing disputes today about rights to build casinos and engage in traditional fishing activities. PC recorded this with help from Claire Stocklazar and Bert Lazar. Then the definition of permanence changes. Permanence is really, in their, in their world, it's not agriculture, they don't have a farm. They have this sort of gathering, hunter-gatherer, hunter and fishing gathering, what they call complex hunter fishing hunter gathering uh, cultures that are utilizing a vast area of the river as their place. And they're, they're sharing that with all these other tribes too. There's no, there's no lines. They, they're respectful, 
they're not going to stick their village into somebody else's village. They're going to be a little bit further away. But but there's not a lot of conflict there. They're trying to have a trade relationship. They're they're intermarrying with folks. They're they're trying to get wealthy off of the land. So here's kind of pictures of fishing culture back in the day. Um, there's no uh, photographs till much later of the tribes. Some people did like drawings and woodcuts and things. These are all like woodcuts at some level. Uh, we have Swan here, and we have other folks drawn. This thing is Drayton and stuff. Um, and so we see, uh, you know, Lion Falls in the background there. This was kind of interesting because the, the, the plank house is very rude, which is probably the case. They didn't have mill lumber. So they, they put stuff together out of what they could split, what they could find them on, you know, driftwood, that kind of stuff. A woman here cooking. And then we have a woman here also tending to something. Perhaps we see Americans coming in and being taken land. In the 1830s, it's mainly sort of these French Canadian and missionary sort of peoples coming in, taking land, being to set up like an infrastructure for settlement. And then uh, by 1844, we start to see the Oregon Trail forming, and the Applegates and the folks are coming over um, the trail into Oregon, creating the trail really into Oregon. Uh, and that, and, and they're attracted by these descriptions, mainly from people like Jason Lee, who's a Methodist minister in the valley, who had been there a couple of years, saying, hey, we, you know, there's like all this really nice farmland, it's all cleared off, it's really just ready to go, it's actually kind of almost like an Eden on earth, and he wants more white people to come to Oregon, he actually calls them white people, I'm not making it up, come to Oregon so that his, his ministers, his male ministers are not, are stop marrying and I guess shack it up with native women. So uh, he's a little bit racist in the way he thought, uh, or quite a bit racist. In, in another show featuring issues about indigenous people, PC captured video at a Black Lives Matter Arbor Lodge protest in November 2022. This particular protest was billed as a day of mourning and was focused on debunking the myths about the holiday known as Thanksgiving. You'll hear speakers discussing why there's really nothing for indigenous people to be thankful for, ways to resist the racist culture that produced it, and calling for a better future. I was actually at this protest as a participant. As a member of Portland Cop Watch, I was invited to connect police brutality to the issues of the day. The sights and sounds and many, many protest signs there are part of this show that we waited to air until October 2023, reflecting sentiments from the event I called the show, You Can't Pour Gravy on Genocide. protest here today uh, and it's not just a protest this is a place of community and it is a place of solidarity uh, this is an indigenous day of mourning and that is why we are all here together we are here to resist the colonialist and capitalist lies of Thanksgiving Today in particular, though, I'd just like to say that instead of celebrating uh, the white supremacist colonizer uh, so-called holiday of Thanksgiving, we are here as a day of mourning for the loss of thousands and thousands, probably millions of my people. And, um, and they have it all dressed up uh, with, uh, uh, under the guise of a, a patriotic uh, holiday uh, to celebrate the beginning of the United States, when literally it's well documented in multiple places that the colonizers or settlers were literally, literally thanking God for the demise of my people so that they could have this land. How does this uh, indigenous making good trouble relate to why you're here? when the laws in the United States have been uh, designed for the purpose of uh, 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 disparately supporting white folks and uh, 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 disparately uh, 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 undermining, marginalizing, oppressing uh, people of color, indigenous people, black folks in particular, um, this puts us in a space where uh, uh, 
actually to be good, I think oftentimes we have to uh, uh, fight against that system. Freedom in our lifetime! Yeah. The revolution will not be televised! PC Perry here, uh, interviewing and introducing Barb, who is our uh, Rough Cut editor extraordinaire. Um, I'm not remembering if I'm supposed to ask you if we've been doing this for how many years? I've been with uh, Flying Focus for 28 years now, and it's been grand. Thank you. What's the show we're working on? Is that uh, getting involved? And how did you uh, find working on that project? So this program um, was great. Um, it uh, The clips you're about to see are from five or six different uh, demonstrations that PC went to and interviewed people about why, how they got inspired to go out in the street and um, why they're still there, even though the giant demonstrations from 2020 are over, the issues are not. We're calling for justice and for reparations. Uh, this weekly event uh, began during 2020 and it was in response to the murder of George Floyd and to police brutality and police murders in this city as well, particularly of black people. Uh, we're here to say that black lives matter and we're calling for true justice and accountability. We believe in transformative justice instead of the incarceration systems and rampant uh, police brutality and police power. We want this system to be fixed. Because one thing that you cannot, you cannot lie and say that you don't know is that there is no good cop in a racist system. So as long as the system is broken, our way of life is going to continue to be broken. My niece, Delight Atterbury, is missing. She's an enrolled member of the um, Confederated Tribes of Siletz, and she's um, her dad's Peru, so she's also Peru from California. Um, I put up red dresses for her. She, I put up handprints for her, and they arrested me. And uh, the word help. I put the word help, and they arrested me for it. That's what we're doing here. We've been on this corner ever since George Floyd's murder. Uh, we not only stand for Black Lives Matter, but we stand in solidarity as well as Indigenous folks. We have all so suffered at the, the hands of colonialism. We just keep coming back because whenever there's injustices, there's always something to do. And, and, and we can't give up. We have to continue the fight. One of the big things that really inspired me was in 1968, there was an AIM takeover, American Indian Movement takeover with the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. that was all over the news at the time. Black and white television, you know, all that stuff. Well, I was just a little guy then. I was like seven, eight years old. And to see this going on, what little bit I did see on the news, they, uh, it inspired me from that point on. <laughs> as I got older and a little bit smarter every year, I realized more and more about how the system works how it's against people of color. Creating community through lunch is the uh, footage we're going to take a look at here. Barb did the uh, editing on it. Great job. And I want to know, Barb, what did it look like? Uh, what did you get out of it? What was going on? Well, this program covers the uh, Beacon Village Lunch Bunch, and they provide lunch to anybody. Everyone is welcome. Um, most of their clients are houseless people. Um, and they use lunch in a very innovative way to create community amongst the houseless people, um, give them a place to hang out and provide them with uh, food as well as other supplies that they might need like blankets, et cetera. Um, it's a, a, a very lovely program and very different from what the city is doing um, punitively to houseless people. There's no barrier at the door. 
absolutely, absolutely anyone is uh, is is welcome to come. We don't uh, uh, we, we we welcome everybody, both to come and eat, and if you want to come and volunteer, you want to help, we'd love to have you. It's, we're, we're we're all volunteers here, uh, and uh, p people who just you know want to come by and 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 have a chance to socialize a little bit. There's a lot of that going on here too, and I think that that's important. That that you need to have people to talk to, and and, and we've got that here, and and uh, you know a few other necessities of life. We got some clothing and some books and things for people who might need that hygiene items. So uh, Tuesday through Tuesday through Saturday, come on down. Do you suppose it's hard for people to get here? that are housed, that are not housed? Oh, I think um, if, you, if you stand out stand out in front of our door uh, just before 1, a, 1 p.m. and you, you see folks arriving and, uh, you know, some are pu pushing carts and some have, uh, some have bicycles and some are just coming in their walkers. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, I, I think there's probably some some sacrifice involved in getting here to get a meal, but um, everybody's welcome. Being inside here has been so transformative. Is that like even with that pressure, you can take a load off. You can sit in a soft chair. You can sit in a seat with a table and a plate and a spoon. You know, you're not like huddled under a, 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 a canopy on the sidewalk or like posted up on a retaining wall with your stuff sort of sitting there as like the birds and the rats and the bugs are just like looking at you being like, I can't wait, <laughs> you know, right? Like there's, it's, it's so like it does, it just takes a slight weight off of all everybody else's shoulders. So that way folks can interact more peaceably with one another. So that way, you know, folks can feel just a little bit more calm. Like, the smoothest and calmest day on the sidewalk has never matched up to the busiest and heck most hectic day here. That does it for part one of the 32nd bus anniversary. I am and forever will be PC Perry of Flying Focus Video Collective. Thank you for joining us. And I'm Dan Handelman. Uh, you heard us talk about people who aren't on the show today who help with some of our programs. We welcome participation by more people who want to make the world a better place. Learn about Flying Focus by calling us at 503-239-7456 or writing to ffbc at flyingfocus.org. Our voicemail at 503-321-5051 also accepts text messages. We produce our shows through Open Signal slash Portland Community Media, whose channels, for the time being, are funded by cable subscribers and a government mandate about using public rights of way. You've seen me, Barb, and Dan. Also with us today is Moss Drake, another Flying Focus founding member who is directing the show. Also, Linda Candelo is assisting with our recording today. Thank you. At Flying Focus, most of our funding comes from community member donations, including for copies of our shows. We run on a shoestring budget, we're all volunteers, and we don't get much through grants. We're glad you were able to join us to look back at our 32nd year of programming. And thanks to everyone who's volunteered over the years and to the guests on our shows. Tune in next week at the same time for part two of the 32nd bus anniversary. <laughs> To Linda. So wait, wait. Yeah. So we'll and we'll we'll cut <laughs> There you go. Oh, there,
Okay, we're running on a shoestring budget. 